So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Cesar Rodriguez Garavito. I'm the chair of the Center for uh, Human Rights and Global Justice at NYU Law and director of the Climate Litigation Accelerator, which is the program that's partnered with the IGSD on this particular webinar. And I really wanna thank colleagues at IGSD uh, for having uh, proposed the topic uh, for today's uh, session. So as uh, those of you who are recurrent visitors and participants of uh, the community of practice webinars put together by uh, CLX, this is really a collaboration. All right, All right. I got it. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Romina, we're, we're, we're live. Uh, uh, and welcome. Welcome, Romina. Uh, we have our, our lineup uh, now complete. And uh, Romina, we're just getting started. Uh, I'm introducing the panel, and we're going to go. Um, uh, we're going to go to um, Gabrielle first, and then we'll start our conversation in the panel. So, uh, as I was saying, this is uh, a collaboration of uh, around 200 organizations at this point. The community of practice that CLX is uh, uh, curating, and we're very open to partners and colleagues proposing topics, cases, reports uh, that open up new avenues and new ideas for climate litigation to be discussed here and featured in uh, the monthly webinars. By the way, we're gonna take a couple of months of, of, uh, of rest in July and August and be back with the webinars in September. But this one is uh, very cutting edge in that it is proposing um, a topic and a form of litigation that has received less attention, both in this community of practice and in the field of climate litigation uh, writ large. I won't go into details of what fast litigation and, uh, means in the, in the uh, title for this panel that we proposed and circulated in the invitation because uh, our uh, guest here uh, will uh, start by clarifying what that is. But I'm just going to say that one of the main goals of this community of practice and this year's webinars is to speed up climate litigation. So speed and scale are crucial um, goals of and centers of attention of what we do at CLX. This is what we call the, an accelerator, climate litigation accelerator. So uh, this is very much in the spirit of uh, uh, what this community of practice tries to do. And without further ado, I'm not going to introduce all the panelists at once because they have so many uh, credentials that it would take us like half an hour to go uh, through all of them. But we get started, we go right to the point and I'm, we're gonna start uh, with Gabriel Dreyfus who will introduce uh, the uh, topic uh, on the concept of fast litigation. So Gabrielle is chief scientist at IGSD where she collaborates with leading experts and international partners to conduct research and craft and advance policies to slow global warming through strategies to control um, SLCPs. And I'm gonna ask you to, uh, to uh, spell that out for us. It's a, it's a, it's a technical term that I'm gonna leave uh, Gabrielle to explain, improving energy, energy efficiency and protect carbon sinks. She is an adjunct lecturer at Georgetown University, member of various technical review committees uh, and task forces, an author of key and impactful scientific reports. So with that, Gabrielle, uh, thanks for accepting the invitation and the floor is yours. <clears throat> thank you, Cesar, and thank you to the community of practice for hosting us today. I'm going to use some slides uh, to uh, help illustrate um, the science context um, for fast mitigation and why fa both fast mitigation and fast litigation is so important to our survival. Uh, this is based on a paper that we just uh, published in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences. It came out at the end of May and really draws on the 2009 paper led by Mario Molina, Derwood Zelke, um, Ramanathan and others that identify this concept of fast mitigation, which is actions that can happen in the next two to three years that can uh, be uh, put into place 
within five to 10 years and actually deliver a climate response within a decade. And this is where this concept of SLCPs or short-lived climate pollutants is so important. And stepping back from that, it really has to do with the fact that uh, we're not facing one climate emergency. There are actually two that we have to address simultaneously. And this is gonna get to uh, this concept of timelines that as we know, as we're experiencing massive heat waves that would have been an impossible without human induced climate change, droughts and uh, massive floods, uh, these are all events that are happening now. So really the last 10 years, we've started to see climate change is no longer a problem for the future. When I was in graduate school 20 years ago, we were talking about climate change as something that you know is in the future. We had time to prepare for. Well, we've, we're out of time. We're seeing impacts today. And so this is very much focused on the strategies that can actually slow global warming in these crucial decades to give us the time to adapt and to transition our energy systems. So most people are focused on CO2, carbon dioxide and energy systems, uh, also a large contribution from land use change to CO2. And CO2 is essential and important. Uh, it is the single largest contributor to global warming, but it's not the only one. When looking at the recent IPCC, and in fact, all of the IPCC reports, uh, CO2 is a little bit more than half of the current, what we call radiative forcing, the change in the energy balance at the top of the atmosphere. There are a whole bunch of non-CO2 climate uh, forcers that are uh, essentially contributing half of the warming that we're experiencing today. So a really major takeaway and conclusion that I, I really hope everyone uh, takes away from this presentation is that while decarbonization is necessary, transitioning away from fossil fuels that are the major force for CO, uh, source of CO2 is essential because of the slow nature of the carbon cycle and other effects that slow the, uh, that warm, the, the reduction in warming from decarbonization. It's actually not uh, alone. Decarbonization is insufficient to slow warming in these critical decades. And we may, uh, we're already at about 1.1 above pre-industrial levels, 1.1 Celsius. And we're very likely to pass 1.5 by the early 2030s. And if we only focus on decarbonization because of those lags in response, we are very, we're more likely to pass that even that more hazardous two degree Celsius threshold. And I'm not talking about in 2100, I'm talking about in the next uh, several decades. And so this is why it's so important to think about non-CO2, in particular, the short-lived climate pollutants, the SLCPs. These are our levers. This is an optimistic message. We have levers, in particular, methane, black carbon, which is a particle that comes from, in particular, burning diesel and coal um, from fossil fuel sources. Uh, we have hydrofluorocarbons. These are synthetic gases used primarily in our refrigeration and air conditioning equipment, as well as um, these are other precursors to tropospheric ozone. This is the low level, ground level of ozone smog. These are all super climate forcers. They're uh, tens to hundreds to thousands of times more potent than CO2 at trapping heat, but they live, they're in the atmosphere for only 15 years or less, days to weeks in the case of black carbon. And so by focusing on uh, strategies that target the short-lived climate pollutants, we have the capacity to slow warming in these critical decades. And this is really, we need a dual strategy to uh, tackle the two climate crises, the climate crisis that we're facing now and the CO2, the buildup of warming by the end of the century. So this is in a graphical form for those who prefer graphical, the, the major findings in the paper, where we're comparing two scenarios that are in the published literature. The orange line is where we've taken out, well, if we only do mitigation that's focused on fossil fuel usage, you'll see that orange line, it keeps going up. It doesn't turn and start, the temperature doesn't start to turn um, as soon as if we, uh, the, the, so the panel on the left is the temperature. The panel on the right is the rate, that pace of the warming. And you'll see that only when we combine that decarbonization with these targeted strategies, looking at those short-lived climate pollutants, do we get that green curve where we start to slow that warming in the next decade? And that's critical to keep that 1.5 within reach. 
you'll see their error bars the, on all of these things are the, the climate models are not uh, totally precise on this because there are other feedback mechanisms to take into account. So just to summarize what those ch charts were saying, it's that we combining, that's that green line, decarbonizing with the mitigation of those short-lived climate pollutants. Again, methane, hydrofluorocarbons, black carbon soot, and ground level ozone that can reduce the rate of warming in half, cut it in half between 2030 and 2050, and slow the rate two decades before decarbonization alone. We need to do both of those things if we want to limit this concept of overshoot and keep this 1.5 within reach. And why is 1.5 so important? So this is um, essentially a figure that was published in 2018 comparing this concept of a linear projection of warming. That's that dark red line. The blue dashed lines show us where we are now. We're about 1.1 above uh, current warming. Well, when you take into account feedbacks, the fact that we actually, uh, as we phase out fossil fuels, are producing fewer aerosols that are reflective, we actually are expecting to see an accelerating rate of warming. And this is uh, one of the key findings from the Adaptation and Vulnerability Report, Working Group 2 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This figure shows these different projections of future warming and against which we have these what are called burning ember diagrams on the right, where the darker the red to purple, the higher the risk of triggering uh, critical uh, thresholds in the system. So that can be losing unique systems, earth systems. So we're losing already a lot of, um, we have a lot of uh, ocean, th threatened ocean uh, corals and other ecosystems. We, we are already seeing the second bar, these extreme weather events we, as we're happening now. The red dotted line shows us where 1.5 is, but we're just about, we're in that gray bar across 1.1. Uh, and then the, the bar on the right, reason for concern five, is one of the reasons why I'm personally, and IGSD is very concerned about warming and the rate of warming now, because there are um, systems, our climate, that, um, can change. There can be abrupt changes in the system. So right now we have the Greenland ice sheet. Well, if we warm beyond about 1.6 degrees, we can actually create this feedback where the Greenland ice sheet will be essentially uh, committed to melting. And then it's a question of how fast and the sea level rise associated with that. The other feedback and tipping point in the climate system that is extremely worrying is what's happening in the Arctic. So this graph shows the temperature in the Arctic, and you can see that it's warming much faster than the global average, about four times faster. And this is really important. There's this effect of Arctic amplification that occurs because the Arctic is usually snow and ice cover that reflects sunlight. Well, as it gets warmer, we're losing that snow cover and we're losing that reflection. And that reflection means less energy stays in the system. So, and so it means it's absorbing more energy. You get more melting, you get less reflection, you get more energy being absorbed. That's a feedback. And if we get to a point where, and as we lose that snow and ice cover, that reflection, we're actually absorbing, um, if we lose all of the summer sea ice, that's in the Arctic, for example, for the entire summer months, it's the equivalent of adding a trillion tons of CO2 to the atmosphere in terms of the extra energy that would be captured. And this is really important. This is a diagram that shows that you have these connections in the climate system so that if we lose that Arctic ice, we get extra warming in the Arctic, we get commitment of melting of the ice sheet that has effects on the overturning circulation, the ocean circulation, this Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, that's what AMOC stands for, which changes the way that heat moves to Europe and, uh, to, uh, and then has an effect on the Sahara and the Amazon rainforest, which then has further effects on drying and application and then on the West Antarctic ice sheet. So you have all of these tipping points that the, the, the Amazon forest now there is a point at which it could get pushed to becoming a savanna and completely change its system. And so in addition to the snow and ice on the ocean, you also are losing snow and ice on land, which has effects on permafrost and thawed permafrost, which is a natural source of CO2, methane, and NTO, which are also climate forces and can keep, contribute to these feedbacks. All right, so that's the context of what's happening. Now I wanna dive into why carbon dioxide alone can't slow warming 
in the near term. It's absolutely essential to stabilize in the climate. Every kilogram of CO2 that we put into the atmosphere stays there for centuries. The carbon cycle is slow to remove carbon and lock it in geological reservoirs. So this graph, I want you to focus on two curves. The first is the blue curve. Um, this is actually a good news that came out of these, these, these studies that show that if we were to completely stop emitting CO2 tomorrow, the climate would essentially stop warming. That's what that blue curve is showing. But here's the thing. We don't live in a climate model. We can't just turn off CO2 by itself. We have to think about the sources of CO2. And the major sources of CO2 are burning fossil fuels. And when we burn coal in particular or sulfur containing diesel, it remits CO2 plus sulfates. And sulfates are very reflective. And so as we turn off those coal plants, for example, we're actually gonna get something more like that red curve where you, the sulfates only stay in the atmosphere for days to weeks. So we turn off the CO2 and the sulfates when we turn off those coal plants, but you actually get that warming in the near term, this idea of unmasking as the warming that's in the system becomes more apparent as those reflective sulfates fall out of the atmosphere. And so what we really are focused on is this dual strategy, this purple curve, which is what happens when you have you turn off your coal plants, but you also turn off your, um, so black carbon sources, you're gonna get some of that when you turn off your coal plants, but methane from agriculture and landfills, if you target those and leaks um, upstream from uh, abandoned coal mines, but also these synthetic gases, that's where we want this purple curve. That's what we're targeting. And just to show again, why that why thinking about sources and of pollutants not as just this knob that you can turn of co2 only but what are the emissions that are coming from that coal plant this is a figure from the working group one of ipcc the science uh, report from last august and you can see that carbon dioxide is currently contributing about 0 0.8 celsius uh, to warming whereas methane is about 0 0.5 even though there's far less of it it's much more potent but you can see that in the red bar, the same sources of carbon dioxide are also the primary sources of those sulfur dioxide, those sulfur particles that are reflecting those sulfates, and those are masking half a degree. So once we stop emitting those sort, we turn off those sources for sulfates, that half a degree, that's going to be unmasked and going to add and that contribute to that accelerated warming. In contrast, the sources of methane. So this is a paper that came out in 2019 that looked at studies of scenarios that were able to stay consistent with 1.5. So these studies phase out fossil fuels quickly. But when you think about the impact of phasing out those fossil fuels, that decarbonization strategies and the CO2 and the SO2, that's the sulfates together, you actually get this near-term warming. But methane sources, which are primarily associated with oil and gas extraction and transport, uh, with coal bed, so not the combustion of the gas, but the extraction process. So you've got the fossil fuel sector is about a third of methane human sources, then about a third, uh, a little bit more than that is from agricultural activity. That's primarily livestock, cows, and enteric fermentation. Cows belch a lot of methane. Um, and then there's also about uh, a little less than a third is coming from landfills as organic matter decomposes in the absence of oxygen and waste wastewater sources. So those are all the human sources of methane, but they're also natural sources of methane that are on the order of 40 to 50% of atmospheric methane sources in a year. This What this graph is showing is that while you have that near-term warming from fossil fuel phase out, if you do methane targeted reductions, you actually can get much faster impact on that climate about, um, you can get about 0 0.3 degrees uh, by 20, 2040s, 2050s. And then this is just for added reference that the, this is starting to be recognized more clearly, but it's been a little bit slow because of this confusion about the time period, this near-term warming versus long-term warming concept that's really important to differentiate. And so really the key point I hope that you'll take away is that the strategies, the pollutants, but more importantly, the mitigation strategies that we need to use to slow warming in the near term are complementary and distinct from the fossil fuel 
um, decarbonization strategies that are essential to, to, to essentially stabilize that longer term warming. And we need to do both. That this concept of global warming potential or CO2 equivalents implies that they're tradable and they're not when it comes to the actual impact on the climate and the timeline for those impacts. So we really need to do both of these things. And so we like to think about this as we're running three races simultaneously. We have a sprint where you need to slow these emissions of climate of these short-lived climate pollutants to slow warming in the near term to give us time to adapt and at the same time and adapt and do the decarbonization. This is a marathon. It takes more time to transition our energy systems. And then there's an ultra marathon, which is developing the technologies to remove carbon dioxide and methane and possibly do some climate intervention to reduce risks across some of these tipping points. And so with that, um, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, looking forward to having a discussion. Thank you, Gabriel. That was extremely helpful. A lot of complex science to be presented in clear terms and for the use and benefit of the uh, climate litigation community that comes together in the community of practice. So now we have about 15 minutes left before we go to Q&A. We already have a question and we're keen for to make this interactive. By the way, as those of you who uh, have been in community practice webinars before, we will have a second segment that will be closed door um, right after we're done with the public event at the top of the hour. Uh, there's a separate link, uh, for, so we hope you will, you will join us there. That's the place uh, to ask uh, more detailed questions and, and engage in more interaction with the panelists. For now, we're, I'm gonna go to each of them in turn and ask uh, one question, one prompt, uh, and I'm going to ask them to keep their comments to five minutes so that we can go back to the um, uh, group of participants for questions and, and comments. So uh, we have next uh, Durwood Salke, who's a founder and president of IGSD in Washington, D.C. and Paris, where he focuses on fast mitigation strategies to protect the climate, including reducing SLCPs. Prior to IGSD, Salke was the co-founder and president of the Center for International Environmental Law, SEAL, that's a, an active participant in this community of practice, and director of the Secretariat for the International Network for Environmental Compliance and Enforcement. Um, so, Durwood, um, what's your sense about how much climate litigation is paying attention to short-lived climate pollutants? And, and, uh, and uh, go, looking, towards the future, uh, how would you suggest we look at new legal theories, claims, and remedies in future litigation so as to address the uh, issues that have received uh, limited attention and that Gabriel has put on the table very uh, eloquently here? Well, I think it's obvious, uh, at least it is to us, that the litigation community is not focusing nearly enough on this opportunity. You know, what Gabby just told us is that we can't keep the climate safe without cutting both CO2 through decarbonization and cutting the short-lived super climate pollutants. If you can't cut the super climate pollutants, you can't slow the near-term warming. I want to make another point about the Arctic. Gabby explained that, uh, you know, we're losing the Arctic right now. It's warming four times the global average. We've lost half of the reflective sea ice already, and we could lose the remaining half within 10 to 15 years. We're down to just a couple of percent of the strong multi-year ice. And when the cyclonic winds kick up in the Arctic and the wave action increases, the ice will break up and flow out. And, and we'll add, as Gabby says, a trillion tons uh, on top of the 2.4 trillion we put in to the climate system since pre-industrial times. That's just the sea ice. Land-based ice will be the same. So that could be 2 trillion. And this could happen within 10 to 20 years. Let's, let's put that as our near term. And uh, the science is, is solid. The observational science is powerful. So if we've only got 10 to 20 years to keep the climate stable and not have the feedback of the Arctic collapse the permafrost, which will release methane, CO2, and N2O, start this wicked cascade that 
Gabby illustrated, where we lose control of the climate system and enter the hothouse earth, you have to do the short-lived super climate pollute. So uh, what do we need to do there? Well, the first thing is the, uh, sci the litigators and, and all of us in the climate space need to understand the relative speed of these two necessary actions, decarbonization, essential but slow. Uh, Gabby, I think the number is uh, aggressive decarbonization will avoid 0 0.1 degree at 2050. Cutting the super climate pollutants avoids four times that amount at 2050. Okay, That means we better put a lot of effort, a lot of resources into cutting the short-lived super pollutants. Now, the solutions are there. So HFCs, you have the Montreal Protocol, the Kigali Amendment, uh, but there's cheating. There is um, illegal trade in the HFC hydrofluorocarbons. That's a great litigation target. The Environmental Investigation Agency is probably the best NGO in the world for investigating these kinds of problems. That sets up good, uh, straightforward cases. Black carbon soot, a uh, very powerful climate pollutant. It's an aerosol, not a well-mixed gas. And the tropospheric ozone, both of these are uh, among the short-lived super pollutants that Gabby mentioned. Those are classic air pollutants. That means if you do an air pollution case, and there are air pollution protection laws in almost all jurisdictions, we are solving part of climate. At the same time, we're protecting public health and in the case of tropospheric ozone, that destroys crops as well. So we're protecting food uh, resources and uh, uh, food security, and we're protecting our sinks because if you um, if you let the tropospheric ozone uh, degrade your sinks, you're losing other climate protection. So those are those are great cases, but we have to know that they're both air pollution and they're climate cases. And then you've got the um, methane, the single biggest and fastest way to slow warming. And so if you're um, a neighbor living next to a, a pig farm or a, a capos, a concentrated feedlot for cattle, it smells to high heaven because you're emitting uh, ammonia, you're emitting methane and uh, other pollutants. And neighbors can sue under common law nuisance and common law jurisdictions, probably other uh, theories in uh, civil uh, law systems as well. <coughs> Excuse me. There are already lots of cases in the U.S. against um, the big um, pork producers. So there are ways to do this. But, but we need the litigators to help integrate the science. So yeah, we, we need to make this presentation. We need to answer the questions. We need to rehearse over and over so that people understand this is an essential part of how we slow down the feedbacks, avoid the tipping points. Gabby didn't mention, but between the current 1.1 degree of warming and the 1.5, we're cruising to perhaps in the next five years, but certainly in the next 10. Uh, there are six expected tipping points that will be irreversible. And when we hit 1.5, there are another 11 tipping points between 1.5 and 2 degrees. So, you know, we're, we're really right on the edge of complete disaster. And that means uh, helping uh, the litigation community understand the importance of the dual strategy and then having them work with us and, and others to develop the cases. Where do they see the best cases in their jurisdiction? I'll stop there. Thanks, Durban. And th your last sentence is the perfect segue into the questions uh, for Romina and Maxim. Um, so I'll start with Romina, who is a senior policy analyst at IGSD, the NGO representative to the Climate and Clean Air Coalition to reduce short lived climate pollutants, and the president and founder of the Center for Human Rights and, and Environment, SEDA, uh, in Argentina. Uh, Romina was previously Argentina's environmental minister from 2006 to 2008. Uh, so, Romina, speaking of, of litigation, you have extensive experience in. Uh, various types of litigation and also policy making, uh, but specifically 
at SEDA, uh, you work at the intersection of human rights and environmental uh, issues. So could you provide any examples of how human rights may be protected by the inclusion of SLCPs in litigation? Uh, and now that litigants have an opportunity to incorporate SLCPs into uh, litigation to provide additional and potentially quicker human rights protections for plaintiffs? Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here and joined by these panelists as well. Um, so, you know, many years ago, when you thought about environmental cases, um, you only thought about environmental law, and you didn't necessarily have a human rights framework when you approach these cases. Um, I think today, the youth movement has made, made very clear that when we talk about climate, we're talking about human rights, we're talking about climate justice, and these two things go together. Um, the, the last report of the IPCC on adaptation, vulnerability, and impact uh, was described by the Secretary General as the Atlas of Human Suffering, and, um, and dangerous and widespread disruptions are highlighted on, on this report to the um, um, to the event that we are going to have an impact on um, as much as 40% of the world population. I mean, 3.5 billion people uh, are highlighting this report as, as highly vulnerable to climate impacts, right? Um, so, which basically means that if we don't do what Gabby and Durgut says, uh, we are committing the human population of the world to massive human rights violation. Um, so, and this is where, where litigation come in place. Um, I think there is a huge opportunity here uh, for um, engaging the judiciary more actively uh, through a human rights framework. So each time that basically you litigate a, clay, a case, uh, you need to think how this case will help um, on the near term, I mean, to, to a slow warm, uh, global warming on the near term, and what does it mean uh, in, in, to prevent hum, uh, further human rights violations. Um, and what Duru was saying, you know, we used to litigate air pollution cases without thinking about the climate impact. And we used to litigate air pollution cases um, mainly focused on health impacts. Uh, now we have a much broader and um, scope and we have a very strong evidence uh, on science, evidence that the governments of the world, because the, IPC, the IPCC is a report that have been agreed by all countries of the world. Um, so if we were in a perfect criminal case, you will say it's recklessness, that it's, it's negligent that you keep going um, and walking towards the cliff and committing this massive human rights violation uh, with, when you are admit and admit um, that the evidence that you have today in this IPCC report, right? Um, we haven't seen yet criminal cases on climate. Um, I would like to see that, and I have been saying that in every single meeting where we talk about climate litigation, you know, it's time to think about um, the criminal responsibilities of the private um, CEOs, of the private sector CEOs, and of the, um, um, of the political leaders because they know this is coming, they know this is happening, and, and they, keep, they, keep, um, they keep going as, in, as this is uh, no evidence, and it is. So uh, there is a, hunt, uh, there's a whole um, development that we need to think about how to use the criminal law, linking human rights and climate, and near, near mitigation, uh, near-term mitigation together. Uh, and as Uru was saying, there is a whole of cases under civil law um, or tort law concerning um, air pollution, 
concerning um, energy efficiency, concerning um, agricultural burning, concerning methane uh, leaks in the oil and gas sector. So there are, you know, there's a bunch of cases that you can put together using the human rights framework um, alongside the, the climate evidence that, that we have. And I will stop there because I think it's, it's much more interesting to have a discussion, um, but you know, happy to, to answer any questions uh, moving forward. I leave the floor to Maxime, who is actually very engaged on, on what kind of cases uh, right now are in the courts moving, moving forward. Thank you, Romina. Um, by the way, uh, we already have a couple of questions. Uh, please do go ahead for those of you who wanna ask any questions, please post them in the Q&A uh, chat box. And we're gonna end the, the panel with uh, Maxime Bourron, uh, who's the director of the Paris office for IGSD, focusing on international and French and EU climate policy and advocacy and near-term climate mitigation. She has been focusing on advocacy and the development of strategies to promote uh, fast action climate mitigation. Um, and of course, is behind uh, this uh, uh, event. Uh, we've been in conversations for a number of months about the importance of bringing this to the attention of, uh, of uh, the community of practice. So Maxime, could you provide a, an example of successful litigation targeting SLCPs and, and what's your general sense about challenges and opportunities associated with this type of litigation? Thank you, Cesar. Um, I think I'd like to take this opportunity to give uh, the audience a bit of a flavor of the cases that we have, um, we've seen sort of um, uh, in the last sort of year or so. Uh, some of them are actually uh, earlier than that. So I think it could be give, given a useful um, sort of um, flavor of what's um, what's uh, actually being done on the ground. So we have a case in Italy uh, focusing, targeting the uh, fossil fuel giant ENI, <clears throat> first step in front of the uh, OECD national focal points, but very much seen as in a sort of strategical move. Next step will be uh, seeking an injunction to uh, requiring that ENI to cut its methane emission and reduce its leaks. So that's, a, that, that's properly a case targeting the um, the, the methane emission um, and the leaks uh, happening in, the, in pipelines. Uh, so it's the uh, oil and gas methane uh, part that's been addressed in this case. Um, there's also another case related to agricultural methane related to intensive farming um, in the northern parts of Italy at the OECD uh, national focal points. Uh, back a, a, a while ago, now in 2005, I think there was a, a case started by um, a community in the Niger in uh, in Nigeria against uh, a Nigerian corporation and Shell for the uh, for the gas flaring that was happening in the community and it was uh, infringing uh, human rights as protected by the African Charter. Uh, so this case has been ongoing for a while. It's been uh, now on appeal, uh, but yeah, the, the case started in 2005. The appeal is not yet uh, heard. Uh, and, and and a whole sort of um, ecosystem of cases around gas flaring in. Um, in Nigeria. Uh, interesting to follow their developments. Um, in Germany, uh, the, the uh, same, the fossil fuel producer, uh, Wintershall, um, is being, um, is being um, challenged by, uh, by a German NGO and, and specific reference to um, its uh, Wintershall's methane emission and its inaccurate reporting of it. So there are also interesting suits of cases that could come on the inaccurate reporting of oil and gas uh, methane emissions. Um, so in various jurisdictions, we had a series of call cases where we emphasized the climate harms from black carbon emissions of coal burning, as well as methane from coal mining um, that was used in the, um, in the Rocky Hill case, um, which, uh, which won and was a big success in Australia. Um, we also have um, imminently, I think we'll see a, um, complaints to the um, European public prosecutor related to what David was referring to, the illegal smuggling uh, of HFCs um, in, in Europe, a, a big case that I think is going to imminently be um, being put forward. Um, we've also seen more uh, cases coming up in the UK related to the lack of 
strategy around methane um, and well the, the UK just released its net zero strategy and its food strategy or lack of <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the gap here in, in, in how the UK would uh, propose to um, tackle uh, methane emissions related to agricultural methane is um, is a potential challenge that we would, uh, we would we, 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 we've seen um, being discussed. Um, and so, you know, there's, there are numerous opportunities um, to pursue immediately, you know, related to the, the emissions from landfills, pipelines, gas storage, leakages, you know, um, banning venting and flaring. So, um, I mean, you could count the, the, the some successes around the core cases, like for instance, the Rocky Hill, but we, what we see is an emerging uh, trend, I would say, which I, I hope will grow as, as big as needed um, to uh, bring, uh, bring home the prize that Gabby and Derwood uh, were able to successfully present. I mean, the, the size of the prize is so big, the, uh, the, um, the need to cut, um, to, cut um, to reduce temperature at speed and in the right time scale is, um, is worth, you know, you know uh, populating even more cases and, 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 and educating the whole litigation community. Thank you, Maxime. So maybe while you're, while we're uh, looking at cases, one of the questions here in the uh, Q&A uh, box is uh, whether, the, to your knowledge, there have been any analysis of um, academic scholarly analysis of cases of this type. Um, is there any uh, reference that you can provide or any study, ongoing study that you can um, share with the community or practice about this type of litigation? Is this something that you would say has not been uh, analyzed systematically uh, by uh, scholars? And... Uh, to my knowledge, it hasn't, but uh, David and Romina, I haven't seen anything like that. Let's, let's make it, let's give content. <laughs> I haven't seen it. I mean, I uh, the academic analysis can be useful sometimes, but this is there's a lot of really practical uh, information available today that uh, points to some very ripe targets. So I certainly wouldn't wait for an academic analysis to tell us, you know, who the uh, who the bad guys are here and who we should be going after. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, yeah. there, there mm -hmm. has been, you know, some. Um, as uh, there, there is some analysis, not um, specifically with this focus, but on the on climate litigation. You know what kind of cases have been brought, um, and what are these different status of cases. And you know, you you can go online and look. Uh, there are different universities doing that. Uh, but I I do think you know it's time for more than for analysis. As Uru was saying, for actions, and we do need you to think creatively. We do need you to um, to put cases into play as soon as possible because uh, the judiciary is, is not really involved at this moment. I mean, it's just a little cases here and there, and we need massive climate litigation um, that take into account the climate emergency that we are. I think that's that's the main message here. Um, we are not focusing on the climate emergency, and uh, and we have the evidence to take cases to court to force that focus. Thanks, Romina and Maxime. Uh, so Doc Kaiser asks, uh, is the, this is a question uh, for uh, Gabrielle. Is the aerosol and masking problem being taken as additional support for SRM geoengineering techniques? So, so solar radiation management, the concept is linked to the sense that it's the idea of, of putting aerosols in the high level of the atmosphere and use those reflective properties to essentially artificially be a volcano. Because that's where we have the, the, the concept came from, is from volcanoes that naturally will put these uh, reflective aerosols in the air. But the question is more, I would take a step back. And uh, when I think about climate intervention, is what is it that we're trying to prevent? Because the actual aerosols that are falling out of the atmosphere uh, at the low level, the sulfates that come from the coal and, and burning, they're actually very strong climate pollutants, uh, acid rain and other, other things. So I don't think uh, there's justification to directly compensate for the unmasking um, by 
continuing to those pollutants at, at low level. But we do really need to be thinking about the rate of warming and the impacts that it has on these feedbacks and tipping points. And there are other types of climate intervention. A lot of people focus on solar radiation management because uh, using the metric of uh, global scale and cost, but um, there are other opportunities to compensate for um, the, the kind of warming and impacts. And one that I'm, I'm really interested in, we talked a lot about the this ice and snow loss is can we stop or reduce the loss of, of ice and snow through other direct interventions on that ice and snow? Because one of the big concerns with solar radiation management is it is global and it is, uh, it's a very blunt instrument. Um, and then, but there are other approaches that deal with this unmasking are the same concept, uh, but much more uh, controllable and localized. Like um, there's this concept of marine cloud, um, marine cloud brightening, which they're, they're testing actually over uh, the Great Barrier Reef in, in uh, outside of Australia, uh, where you're actually putting in essentially sea salt uh, to create clouds. So I don't know, Derwin, if you want to think about that. I, I just, I, I want to decouple the, the unmasking of aerosols as a pollutant from geoengineering. Right. Uh, th these are uh, good and tough questions. Um, but there's uh, th th the first point is speed matters profoundly. You got to find a way to slow warming in the near term, uh, or you lose control of the climate system. So the first uh, goal, and the one that we're promoting primarily, is uh, to cut the short lived super pollutants, because that's the way to cut the rate of global warming in half and the way to cut the rate of Arctic warming by two thirds. That's a damn good down payment on keeping the climate safe, but uh, but it's not enough. So we, we need to go further. And of course, this is in addition to the decarbonization. And then I would say the next thing that we should be accelerating is the uh, efforts to learn how to remove CO2 from the atmosphere faster than the natural cycle. Uh, but that starts, of course, with the natural cycle. Don't destroy your sinks. I mean, that, that's the best way to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere that we know today. But there are new technologies, as everyone knows, that are now being experimented with. And if we can get them uh, to scale with the right cost, they'll be very important. But uh, but they're not going to give us the, the scale we need probably for many decades. And removing CO2 is not going to give us a fast uh, reduction in temperature either. And then you have, um, what else? Methane removal. Okay, this is new. But Methane Action, uh, a new NGO, is pioneering this with um, uh, some great scientists, uh, Rob Jackson at Stanford, Renaud de Richter in, uh, in France. And they're experimenting. Uh, Copenhagen uh, University has some experiments, too. If we can learn to pull methane out, it's really important because half of methane is not uh, from human sources, but it's from the warming of the world. And as the world warms, we're releasing more methane from uh, wetlands, for example, especially in the tropics. And that, that's pretty frightening. So, so those things are key, and, and they do involve new technologies, and we need some uh, considerable investment to perfect those. Then you get to soft geoengineering that is scalable and reversible. So Gabby mentions the marine cloud brightening. Well, there's another one that uh, Dr. Leslie Field is pioneering to put... Uh, silica beads on snow and ice to enhance the reflectivity of the albedo. And uh, silica is a naturally occurring substance, sand basically. And, and so it seems benign. And if that is to work at scale, that would be brilliant in protecting the, the great white shield in the Arctic. And it's uh, scalable and it's reversible. Then you get to the, you know, the big solar radiation management that's your tough nut, but it seems to me to be uh, necessary to be studying that because if it is necessary to prevent the feedbacks from taking over, pushing us past the, what is it, 6 and 11, 17 tipping points into hothouse earth that will be unlivable for 3.5 billion people, uh, then we better be ready. Okay, and it's, uh, it's our choices are getting harder and harder the longer we wait. 
And the best way to avoid having to deal with that is fast mitigation today and massive scale up of the litigation. Thanks, Durwood. And before we move, for those of you who are part of the community of practice, before we move to the private room for the internal discussion, uh, I'm going to ask a final question taken from uh, a few that our colleague Ben Batros um, uh, shared in the in the chat box here that I think is of interest to the general public. So, and this is for any of you who may uh, have a short answer to this question. So what differences do you see in litigating the different major sources of methane, fossil fuel, waste, and animal agriculture? Uh, look, you mess with farmers, uh, you got to be very careful. There's such a powerful political constituency. But again, as I was saying, neighbors uh, have the right to, uh, uh, you know, a habitable <coughs> environment. So there, there may be some opportunities there. And it depends on the remedies. If your revenue is cheap and elegant and, and actually good for the farmers, like uh, SOP, uh, calcium chloride hydrate that can reduce methane emissions by maybe 50% from the newer lagoons in four days at modest cost, you know, that may be good. Uh, I mean, that would be brilliant. Uh, yeah, oil and gas industry, we should be beating the hell out of them every possible way we can. And then the waste sector, which is local, you know, there, there are great uh, cases there and there are public health risks uh, because they, they catch on fire when the methane leaks. Uh, in the heat wave in uh, Delhi just a couple of weeks ago, there were 300 waste sites that were on fire uh, because of the heat and the methane escaping. So, you know, there, there'd be a lot of support for that too. Thank you, Durwood, Gabriel, Maxime, and Romina for a really fascinating and eye-opening uh, series of, of interventions. And um, this is just the beginning of this conversation, at least for this community of practice. And, and we definitely will keep uh, the, the topic alive. Uh, we're hoping to uh, host other webinars and other events and, and convenings that will center on fast mitigation. This is something that we're committed to. And uh, we hope that you all will join us and also start thinking about ways to move from um, discussion to action and actually filing cases in the various jurisdictions where we operate. So with that, um, thanks everyone who participated in, the, in this uh, webinar. Uh, for those of you in the community of practice who wish to join the private conversation, please use the separate link that was emailed to you.